Good evening. What electricity. It's been like this all day. Everywhere where Cornell West and Robbie George go, there's electricity. And you guys are showing it tonight. I can feel it. I'm Gleaves Whitney. I'm proud to serve as director of the Hallenstein Center for Presidential Studies here at Grand Valley State University. And I just want to tell you a little bit about the organization that is behind this event. The Hallenstein Center is sponsoring this event this, this evening. What are we about at the Hallenstein Center? Well, in our cynical, dysfunctional age, the Hallenstein Center seeks to rebuild confidence in our public institutions. We're not a right-wing enclave. We're not a left-wing enclave. The headlines and storylines of American history do not take place really at the extremes of American history so much as in the middle. The real action in American history unfolds in the middle. This is why I don't understand when people say, oh, the boring middle. The middle is anything but boring since this is where left and right come together and clash. The middle is a field of conflict where these ideas collide and where principled people learn to listen to diverse opinions and harmonize them the best they can in our democratic institutions. We engage in principled compromise. We cultivate the skill to create new possibilities for our communities. It is the only way our democratic institutions can really work. So we're not trying to turn Democrats into Republicans or Republicans into Democrats. It would be educational malpractice to try to engage in that kind of groupthink. We are aiming higher. Our real purpose, our better goal, is to cultivate intellectual diversity. It's to make sure that we can develop strong individuals who know their own minds, yet have the courage to enter the public square and be able to work with people who are different from themselves. That's what the Howenstein Center is trying to promote. It's the, what the founders of our country did two centuries ago. It's what the civil rights movement achieved. And for you, you young people in the room, in the audience today, it's what your generation is called to do as well. Now, our democratic institutions are built or constructed in such a way as to absorb a lot of conflict, a lot of differences of opinion, if, if ethical and skilled people know how to work in those institutions. And that's where the Howenstein Center comes in with our Common Ground Initiative and with our Leadership Academy, with some 40 young people that we're cultivating to understand how the institutions work and how to use those institutions to better our communities. Well, we see ourselves as outfitting a new generation of people to make this country, our community, a little bit better place to live. One of the people who've been in our uh, Leadership Academy and who's now on the staff of the Howenstein Center is Joseph Hogan. He's our program manager for the Common Ground Initiative, and it is my honor to ask Joe to come to the podium now. Thanks, Cleves. Well, let's start with their obvious common ground. Cornell West and Robert P. George are both professors at Princeton. Beyond that, to an outsider, the two seem to share little at all in common. West is a progressive political philosopher, race theorist, and Christian socialist. George is a conservative Catholic philosopher of jurisprudence and natural law. On their respective intellectual, political, and cultural sides, they are immensely, almost unbelievably decorated. West has written 19 books, including the hugely influential Race Matters and Democracy Matters. He's taught at Union Theological Seminary, Yale, Harvard, and the University of Paris appears often on The Bill Maher Show, The Colbert Report, and CNN, was featured in the film The Matrix, and I guess in his spare time produced a spoken word album that, in France, won Best Jazz Album of the Year. <laughs> George is the author of books such as In Defense of Natural Law and Conscience and Its Enemies. He's the vice chairman of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, has served on the President's Council on Bioethics, has received honors such as the Presidential Citizens Medal, and has given honorific lectures at Harvard, Yale, the University of St. Andrews, and Cornell University. 
His students report that sometimes he will miss class, but his absence is excused because more often than not, it's to travel to the Vatican to chat with the Pope. <laughs> Given their huge success, both in the academy and as public intellectuals, these two thinkers could very well consign themselves to their own intellectual and political enclaves. They could live easy lives as pundits. Having ascended the ranks of the left and the right, they could thump their chests, applaud their own, their own side and sneer at the other, and remain forever convinced of their own arguments and sensibilities. But they don't. Instead, they do what they've come here to do tonight. Namely, not only listen to, but deeply engage with the other. Not merely tolerate the other's arguments, but remain open, attentive, and vulnerable to them. In some, pursue common ground, common understanding, and common purpose. So please join me in welcoming to Grand Rapids and Grand Valley, Drs. Cornell West and Robert George. Well, thank you very much, Joe, and thank you, uh, Gleaves. And thanks to all of you, and God bless all of you, for coming out this evening to hear a couple of frail and fallible guys, a couple of broken vessels, but who uh, share a common commitment uh, to the pursuit of truth, the pursuit of understanding and uh, wisdom. Now, I know the first thing you're wondering is which one of us is Cornell West and which one is Robin. <laughs> and we're just going to let you guess. We're not going to reveal that information. But we are absolutely delighted to be here, and uh, not only because it's an opportunity to meet such wonderful people and make such new friends, but because we want to support what is going on in the Hauenstein Center. It is critically important not only to the cause of higher education in this country, to which we ourselves are very, very deeply committed, there's some common ground, but also to our civic world. The kinds of discussions that are being promoted and held here at the Helen Stein Center are really needed not only in our universities, but across the country. So we want to congratulate Gleaves and Joe and everyone who's involved in the center. We want to congratulate the financial supporters of the center and to thank them uh, for making this possible for your own students and for everyone else. Oh, we had a failure of technology. Is that better? Yeah. And we especially want to thank Absolutely. and congratulate the financial supporters of the Hauenstein Center because you make possible the kind of work they do here, the conversations that set an example for others in the country uh, and others in the academy across the country, all the colleges and universities of the country, across the country about what real learning is what serious intellectual engagement that doesn't boil down to partisanship and demagoguery and just having one side up on a high horse preaching and so forth, but genuine intellectual engagement in the common goal of pursuing truth. Now we're gonna say a lot more about that, but before I do anything else, I wanna turn it over to Professor West so that he can say thank you and welcome. Yeah, I just wanna say I am just so blessed to be here. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. So blessed to be here. It's a very special institution. It's a very special center. And my dear brother, Professor Cleves Whitney, has done a magnificent job. And Joe Hogan, who was very young and intellectual in the making with a rich sense of vocation. I want to salute Sister Ann O'Keefe for the wonderful work that she has done. And of course, the captain of the ship, President Thomas Hawes. We, we got a chance to spend some wonderful time with him. And of course, he wished he was here. But this is a very special religious night. And he is where he ought to be which is following his very deep religious convictions. Anytime I get a chance to be in dialogue with Professor George, my dear brother Robert, we go back now 13 years. We revel in each other's humanity. We share a fundamental commitment to the life of the mind and the world of ideas. We've had a chance to teach and lecture around the country. And so when I see him, I don't see him first and foremost as a conservative thinker, con Catholic philosopher, one of the major political figures of our day. I see him as my brother. I see him as my friend and someone who has a right to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Not wrong about everything because we have a very deep commitment to 
Christian faith and Christian tradition and the fundamental commitment to the fact that each human being is made in the likeness and image of God. And we take that preciousness, that sanctity, that dignity very, very seriously, which means we have a whole lot in common. When we read Plato, when we read Augustine, when we read John, John Henry Newman, when we read Martin Luther King Jr. or anybody else, we have a whole lot in common. And in fact, we're deeply concerned about the state of this very fragile and precious experiment in democracy called the U.S., the USA. So that how shall we begin, my brother? Well, the first thing I... Am I going to have to use this again? <laughs> first thing I'd like to do is correct the title of our program. Mm. Now, mm. the title uh, I have here is A Workable Armistice in the Culture Wars. Now, I have no particular love for armistices. <laughs> what Professor West and I are about is conversations, getting at the truth, not just finding a way to agree or a way to avoid difficult issues on which people disagree. But to have a conversation, a conversation whose aim is getting both of the interlocutors or everybody concerned a little nearer the truth. I think it's important to remember that the goal is the goal of truth seeking and the bond that should bind together interlocutors, whether they agree or disagree, is the bond of truth seeking, understanding seeking, wisdom seeking. But for that to happen, there needs to be, as anyone would understand, civility. You have to be able to have a conversation with each other, not just shouting at each other. But that's a commonplace. Anybody will tell you that. Now, often people don't practice what they preach about civility. But they'll all preach civility. I want to suggest to you, and this is growing out of my wonderful years of experience teaching at Princeton with uh, Professor West, Brother Cornell, uh, I want to suggest to you that there are some deeper things that are needed. Mm -hmm. The interlocutors have to acquire, nurture, preserve in themselves certain virtues. If you're going to work together in conversation, even debate, to get at the truth, the people involved in the conversation first have to recognize that they are fallible, frail, fallen human beings. They have to recognize that they could be wrong. Each one has to recognize I could be, even about my most cherished beliefs, I could be wrong. And if in fact one has that attitude and understanding, not in a merely notional way, but in a deeply appropriated way, then one will begin to develop a virtue that is indispensable mm. for truth-seeking, and that is the virtue of intellectual humility. If you don't have intellectual humility, you're going to assume you have everything to teach and nothing to learn. The conversation is not going to be a conversation. It's going to be a lecture. I lecture for a while. He lectures for a while. But that's not going to get us anywhere. When that virtue of intellectual humility is in place, now we can get somewhere. Now, when that's in place, then some magic begins to happen. Because when it's in place, you no longer see your conversation partner, however much you may disagree, as an adversary to be defeated, much less humiliated in debate. Mm. You don't see him as an adversary at all. Rather, you understand him, not just notionally, but in a deeply appropriated way, as a partner in a common enterprise, seeking a common goal, a common good, the good of understanding, of truth, of wisdom, working together through the dialectical method that Plato taught us by telling us about the dialogues of Socrates, the interaction of Socrates with his interlocutors, that attitude now is one in which your conversation partner is your partner in that project toward a common goal, looking for a common good, not your adversary to be defeated. Now, as John Stuart Mill teaches in the wonderful chapter, second chapter of On Liberty, his great work on liberty, which is a, a work mm. that Professor West and I have taught together often for our students, Mill 
preaching a very similar gospel to the one I'm preaching to you now, says there are two possibilities. One is, when you enter into the dialogue, you could be wrong and your partner could be right. If so, and if he can explain to you the arguments and reasons supporting his view, then he has done you an enormous favor. This guy who might have been perceived as your enemy has just performed the greatest act of friendship anybody could ever perform for another person. Move them from error to truth, from an inferior understanding to an enhanced or superior understanding, from a failure on the intellectual side, perhaps even to something as grand as wisdom. What greater gift could someone give? The other possibility, of course, is you could be right, and he could be wrong. But if you are engaging in good faith with a person who is engaging with you in good faith and has something to offer because that person has thought deeply and critically about a subject, even a subject on which he happens to be wrong. Professor West has some experience with this. <laughs> you are going to learn something important even if you are not persuaded, even if you are in fact right. His challenges to you, his counterarguments to your arguments mm -hmm. will help you to understand more fully, more richly, richly, more deeply, and to appropriate more fully, and not to just understand at a superficial level why in fact what you believe is true is true, and what that means beyond just being a proposition what that means about your life, our lives, the lives of our communities. So we have everything to gain and nothing to lose from deep civil engagement with one another in which we treat each other as friends and partners and not as enemies or adversaries. Now just a final word before I turn it back mm -hmm. over to Professor West and that's something about the attitude that all of us have to adopt if we're going to get anywhere in the life of the mind and if we're going to get anywhere in our lives as citizens and fellow citizens, that attitude is the attitude of self-criticism. Your best critic should be you. My best critic should be me. Cornell should only be number two behind me when it comes to criticizing me. <laughs> It's that spirit of self-criticism that is the prophylactic against falling in love with your own opinions and putting opinion ahead of truth. If you've got the self-critical attitude, that will be an attitude that truth matters more than opinion. I don't want to be vindicated. What's that give me? Just psychological satisfaction. Ah, ha, 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 I was right, you were wrong. I don't want to be vindicated, I want to be true. I want the truth. And if I'm in the wrong, if I've got the wrong idea, if I've got the wrong belief, I need to correct myself. I need to get to the truth. That attitude of self-criticism can never end. In the great thinkers of history, those that we should hold in the highest esteem, you find precisely that attitude. Think of how often they are their own best critics. And that prevents the fall into demagoguery, into uh, partisanship, uh, into treating uh, dialogue and conversation the way the sophists in Plato's dialogue treated mm -hmm. conversation. An opportunity to show off, an opportunity to win a victory, an opportunity to get honors, applause, be thought of as somebody important. No, the self-critical attitude is what protects us against that and keeps our eye on the prize, the prize of truth, the prize of understanding, the prize of wisdom. And that's what we really have to inculcate in our young people. Not just those of us who are professors, that's a key aspect of the vocation of people like Brother Cornell and myself. But parents, pastors, leaders, community leaders, 
leaders of affinity groups have all got to be about the business of inculcating in our young people a self-critical spirit. The last thing we want is for our young people or any of us to fall into the attitude that Gleaves mentioned. The Howenstein Center exists in part to fight, and that's the attitude of groupthink. Thinking something because everybody else is thinking it. Or the powerful and the influential are thinking it. Or the beautiful people are thinking it. If you don't understand the argument on the other side and seriously engage it, then you're at very grave risk of falling into groupthink. You would imagine nobody could disagree with me except a fool or a fraud. And that's a very bad attitude. It's toxic to intellectual life, to the life of institutions and to the life of civic orders, of, of uh, societies. So we're very deeply committed in our own teaching to that enterprise, to promoting that particular virtue uh, in our mm. own students. Mm. Cornell? Absolutely, absolutely. I, there's a sense in which for now 13 years, uh, Brother Rob, Professor George, and I have been wrestling with the four fundamental questions of one of the great, if not the greatest, public intellectual in the history of the United States. His name is W.E.B. Du Bois. 1957, he embarked on the writing of three novels. He was 89 years old. He was that committed. He was that courageous. He was that willing to engage in that fallible quest for unarmed truth, but also unapologetic love. The love of truth, love of justice, love of neighbor. Now, we're Christians. We love our enemies. Don't try that one on your own. You need a lot of grace for that one. Du Bois was not a Christian, but he was profoundly spiritual. But the four questions, how shall integrity face oppression? What does honesty do in the face of deception? What does decency do in the face of insult? And how shall virtue meet brute force? Four pillars that bring us together. Inte a quest for integrity, honesty, decency, virtue. I think one thing we fundamentally agree on. Anybody in contemporary America. That's all right. No, it ought to be equally dysfunctional. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Anybody in America who is fundamentally committed to the quest for integrity, honesty, decency, and virtue is profoundly countercultural, cutting against the grain. Because of, instead of integrity, what is predominant in America? Cupidity, love of money. Money, 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 cream, cash rules, everything around me. That's Wu-Tang Clan. <laughs> but it doesn't have to rule me. It doesn't have to rule us. You see, that instead of honesty, what do we get? Much mendacity. Just downright lies. And I'm not just thinking about one TV channel. <laughs> it's, the, the mendacity is across the board. Why? Because they're fundamentally concerned with what? Money, money, money. So what do they do? They dumb down the public conversation into name calling, to sensationalize the exchange rather than the fallible critical conversation necessary for something bigger than all of us. Same is true when it comes to decency. Just attempt to be a decent human being in a world in which more and more it's the survival of the slickest. Well, what Martin King used to say, the obsession with the 11th commandment, thou shalt not get caught. Just look at the business page. What do you see? 
scandal after scandal. More and more politicians, scandal after scandal. And those are the ones who get caught. Can you imagine the ones getting away with what they're doing and not getting caught? We're not talking about color. We're not talking about sexual orientation. We're not even talking about gender, even though most of the folk who get caught are brothers. <laughs> because we still got patriarchal power in terms of the major positions of power, for the most part, still a men. But my hunch is when the women get a chance to move in, <laughs> they shall be susceptible and have deep proclivities toward the same seductions and temptations because the system itself is one in which it makes it difficult to be able to maneuver in such a way that it puts a premium on integrity, honesty, decency. And when we become the virtue, especially in the face of brute force, Ferguson, Staten Island, arbitrary policing, precious folk killed, maimed, murdered, and so forth. How do you express your rage in such a way that following the legacy of Ella Baker, Rabbi Abraham, Joshua Heschel, or Dorothy Day, or Martin King, that rage is expressed through love and justice rather than hatred and revenge? Virtue in the face of brute force. No democracy can survive predicated on cupidity, mendacity, survival of the slickest, and escalating hatred and revenge in a context of increasing wealth inequality. 1% of the population own 43% of the wealth, with 22% of the children live in poverty, and nearly 40% of the children of color live in poverty in the richest nation of the history of the world. That's a moral disgrace. That, for me, is an ethical abomination. My dear brother agrees in terms of the fact that these are realities with which we must come to terms in the name of integrity, honesty, decency, and virtue. And as Christians, both of us Christians, we know Christians have no monopoly on integrity, honesty, decency, and virtue. I know this is Holy Week and we focus on a Palestinian Jew named Jesus. That's the beautiful thing. But we tend to accent Easter Sunday and not the Good Friday. Oh, this exemplary figure of integrity is crucified. And the attempt to snuff out that love, that honesty, that integrity, that decency. The Roman Empire attempts to do it. It's easy to show up on Easter Sunday because Americans love to be identified with a winner, especially winner take all. But there's no Easter Sunday as we know without that crucifixion, that cross, that suffering, being misunderstood, misconstrued, lied on, and then that political crime of killing this particular Palestinian Jew as a political criminal, the king of the Jews, as it were. What a challenge. And that's precisely what we attempt to do both at Princeton and no, I should say I actually do teach at Union Theological Seminary, but I teach at Princeton as well. I just want to make that clear because I did retire from Princeton. I love my Princetonians, but, uh, uh, but I'm in, in New York now. But we get a chance to teach at Princeton precisely to do what? To transmit to the younger generation. Don't believe the hype about the obsession with money, status, wealth, and power. Your fundamental question will always be, what does it mean to be human? What kind of human being will you choose to be? And when you make that short move from your mama's womb to tomb, what will they say at your funeral? They're not going to talk about how much money you made. They're not going to talk about your trophy spouse. They're not going to talk about how many hookups and connections you made in your life. They're going to talk about whether this person really was serious about their quest for integrity, honesty, decency, and virtue. And we all fall short. Try again, fail again, fail better, as the great Samuel Beckett used to say. Try again, fail again, fail better. We all will be failures in one sense, but at least we attempt to intellectually have integrity, morally have integrity. 
And so when we get to the concrete issues, of wealth inequality, legacies of male supremacy, the plight of our indigenous people, the plight of working people, the plight of our precious children and the state of their souls in such a market-driven culture that tries to convince them that to be human is just to be titillated and stimulated rather than learn how to love and learn how to care and learn how to nurture others. These are the fundamental questions that we are blessed to wrestle with in our class. And we, we, we have not just fun, but I think young people around the country and the world are experiencing a kind of spiritual moral awakening. They're tired of the market-driven way of life that tells them that somehow the end is just to be the winner at the top, to be successful, rather than to also focus on what are you gonna use your success for? What are you really faithful to? Not your material toys, but other persons' grander moral causes, and most importantly, that sense of who you really are in the dark. Not what you see in the mirror. Mirrors can lie. When you turn off the lights and then engage in Augustinian introspection. <laughs> Honest, candid introspection. I, uh, I didn't agree with one point there in particular. I do not see the signs. Maybe you were expressing a hope of the awakening, not among people generally and not among young people generally. Now, I do see the signs in certain places. When you get a group of students, for example, who sign up for a particular class because they want to be challenged with the deep existential questions, they want to reflect. They're already halfway there before they walk in the door. And you share with them as a teacher Sophocles, Plato, St. Augustine, all the way up into the 20th century, Buber, Niebuhr, Dewey, C.S. Lewis, Strauss, Martin Luther King. There's no question you can turn on the switch, you can light the fire. But what do we see with the great mass of people? And not just here in the United States, in this age of globalization, the glamorization of the very things that you and I are so much concerned about. And I'm, I'm glad you said, second time around, that it's not just money. In a way, that would be the easiest thing to tackle if what people cared about was money, just money, the green stuff, fetishizing the green stuff. No, we've got a culture that glamorizes power, status, influence, pleasure, showing off, being somebody important. But when that happens, nobody's pausing to ask those fundamental questions. What does it mean to be human? What is my vocation? What am I on this earth to do? How do I relate to my brothers and sisters in my community and beyond? No, we get a glamorization. And so people can live out their entire lives building a fantastic resume, building a great fortune, building public influence and status. But when you fall in love with those things, when you fall in love with the applause, when you fall in love with the celebrity, or if you lust after them even though you don't get them, the one thing I can guarantee you, the one virtue you will not have is the virtue of courage. A a vital virtue that we find missing everywhere. You're not gonna be willing to risk status, influence, people thinking well of you, being important, being applauded to take an unpopular stand. That takes courage. But when you're in love with what's been glamorized, you're gonna pull back before you take that risk. So that too is a challenge that we as teachers and universities like Grand Valley have, and we've gotta meet that challenge. Now, I happen to think, and I think Brother Cornell agrees, that 
one of the key ingredients to meeting that challenge is the revitalization of the idea of the liberal arts. Now this is not, don't get me wrong, I am not condemning engineering or mathematics, or, I'm not condemning that. Those are worthy things. Or even business education or communications. I know those are, those are valuable contributions to the lives of universities and for many students they, they are part of their vocational mission. I get that. But when the liberal arts is merely paid lip service to, or are merely paid lip service to, and we've reduced education to vocational technical study, professionalization, we will lose that great opportunity in the lives of so many of our young men and women to stimulate them to look beyond the pleasure and power and money and influence that's being glamorized to what really matters, to what it means to be a human being, to live a life of virtue, decency, honesty, integrity, to be courageous when one is required in conscience to not go along with whatever the group think is. The liberal arts plays a crucial role or play a crucial role in that. And if we lose them, as we have in so many institutions around the country that continue to present themselves to the public as liberal arts institutions, I think then we are in big trouble. Now, part of the program of reform, I think, should be the creation of centers of excellence within the liberal arts in the universities and colleges around the country. An institution doesn't have to be a thoroughgoing 100% liberal arts institution to have a vibrant liberal arts component that contributes to the well-being of everyone else in the university. When students are doing liberal arts study, when they're studying Plato and Dante and Shakespeare, when they're wondering about what on earth could have caused the First World War, this great mystery that still is not solved, when they're concerned about the kinds of issues that Du Bois was concerned about, or Strauss in political philosophy was concerned about, or that Mill was concerned about, or that Newman was concerned about, they will enrich the lives of their fellow students, even those of their fellow students who are not themselves on the liberal arts side of the curriculum, those who are in the professional or pre-professional disciplines. This is a lesson that we relearned in our class last night from John Henry Newman, his great work which we assigned to our students and discussed last night in our seminar on the idea of a university. Newman was concerned about two things, and tell me if this sounds familiar to you. He's writing all the way back in the 1850s, before our Civil War, it's a long time ago, he's concerned about two big issues that he thinks are toxic to university education professionalization and over-specialization. Students studying and faculty as scholars exploring narrower and narrower fields, becoming experts on narrower and narrower bits of inquiry or knowledge to the point where they have nothing to say to each other. There's no common intellectual grist for the mill. This was in the 1850s. And we look at what we face today, the challenges we face today, and there it is. Then another point that uh, Professor West Messon, and we discussed this just a little bit, maybe dis discuss it a little bit more um, in our meeting with uh, some folks um, here from the faculty and administration this afternoon. Professor West laid some uh, emphasis on income inequality or wealth inequality. There we have a difference of opinion. I think the fundamental economic problem for us, by economic problem I don't mean technical problem, I mean justice problem, I mean what you mean when we're talking about economic problems, is not inequality as such because I don't think that economic equality is a value as such. I think our problem is the diminution to the point of near collapse of social mobility. The great glory of this country, despite all our flaws and problems over the centuries, has been the experience grounding the hope that 
if I work hard, if I commit myself, if I'm a good parent, my children can be better off materially, at least. Material isn't the only thing, but at least materially, I can be, my children can be better off than I am. We find today, people no longer believe it. Parents don't believe it, in many cases, in many sectors of society. And young people don't believe it of themselves. They don't believe they will have a materially better life than their parents. You know why they don't believe it? Because they're smart. <laughs> they don't believe it because it's not true. The real problems, and, and Professor West and I, I think, would agree on what some of the problems, the underlying problems are. We both have some big problems about what happened in 2008 and 2009. The gangsterism, the thievery, the frauds on Wall Street. By the way, who went to jail? So we agree on some of the causes, and then there are deeper causes going far back before that. But I think the goal should be to restore that social mobility. That, to me, is the value, not equality as such. What do you think? I think that they, they do go hand in hand. But what I'm a little uh, weary of is if we shift to social mobility, upward mobility, it could easily downplay the ways in which escalating wealth inequality contribute to the lack of social mobility. So they really do go hand in hand for me. When we met our dear brother, uh, President Thomas Hawes, and he was talking about 41% uh, of the students in this grand institution are first generation. That is magnificent. It makes it a very special place. It means you come in with tremendous fortitude and determination, a willingness to hit the ground, move in, like it was in the 1920s and 30s in New York and City College, you see. Uh, and yet at the same time, if you come in and there's no jobs with a living wage, even with a degree, you, see, you still have a structural problem. If you, in, if you graduate with a student debt, that is so far beyond your capacity to pay so that you're in a kind of financial bondage for the next 20 years, even as you fall in love and have precious gifts from heaven and children and so forth, that still has to do with that entrenched wealth inequality. You see. Now, the danger of someone like myself, of course, who likes to zero in on not just the 1% who has 42% of the wealth, but the 0.01% who have over 19% of the wealth. That's very few people. They say, oh, Brother West, you just anti-rich. No, no, I'm a Christian. I love everybody now. <laughs> uh, I'm serious about that. We're just talking about what mechanisms of fair legal accountability those at the top with unbelievable wealth have to those large numbers of people who have the limited opportunities and therefore don't have a possibility to engage in that social mobility, you see. But do, do, would you agree with that? What, is there... I, what I don't agree with is the aim of equality as well, such, income equality. equality. Just fair, fair yeah. economic inequality. I do not deserve to make as much money as Beyonce. She's the greatest entertainer of her generation. And she gets up 4 o'clock every morning to get, stay in shape. I'm not doing that. <laughs> I get up at 6.30 and read Plato and Du Bois and Toni Morrison, you know. But I should add, spiritually and artistically, Beyonce is not Aretha. <laughs> a shift has taken place spiritually and artistically that in the culture of superficial spectacle, you can be a first-rate entertainer like Beyonce, but you're unable to stir the soul the way Aretha, Sam Cooke, Donny Hathaway, Luther Vandross, the Jones girls, the Hutchison sisters of the emotions. And we want to get into the dramatics and the delphonics and enchantment and the whispers. 
because these are love warriors and not just entertainers. You see, and that is crucial in terms of that younger generation waking up. What is the soundtrack of the Ferguson moment? Why do they go back to Curtis Mayfield? Why do they go back to Nina Simone? Why do they go back to Gil Scott Heron? Because these are not just entertainers. Why do they yearn for John Coltrane's Love Supreme? That's not just a song. That's his soul. Vulnerability, honesty, decency, a willingness to touch souls, to be on fire for something bigger than oneself. Now, for those of us who are Christian, it's the beloved community, the kingdom of God. It's not a brand. The beloved community is not a commercial. It's not a PR strategy. Is not a game to play to engage in upward social mobility. John Coltrane brought his group together. They never talked about money one time, Elvis Jones said, because they were so deeply into the music. And when Elvin Jones went to jail, John Coltrane just bought his house in, in Long Island. He put up his brand new house because he said, I can buy another house, but I can't get another Elvin. That's called love. That's the deepest kind of way of being in the world. To learn how to die in terms of your own ego so that you're able to live and be reborn with a love, a critical orientation, a compassionate disposition. That's what's missing among not just the younger generation, but in our culture as a whole. That's what a thoroughly marketized culture does. So you end up with marketized religion. Mega churches, not a lot of mega love. <laughs> CEOs running churches, not a lot of pastors. Praise teams, but not a lot of choirs. Y'all see what I'm saying? No one group has a monopoly on it because it affects all of us no matter what color. It takes courage to love in a genuine way to take a risk, go on the edge of life's abyss, to be vulnerable, and then most importantly, to cultivate the capacity to receive, to listen, to embrace, and that's what we're losing uh, in the culture at large. And uh, how do we get it back? By means of example. This is what we try to do. We just simply say, as fallen finite human beings, Take a look at what we try to enact and embody, even when we fall in our faces. What we try to enact and embody because it's the best of what came before. We are who we are because somebody loved us. Somebody enacted that kind of care for us. And it was through those examples we could see. And of course, Thomas Kempis, the invitation of Christ as well. It could be imitation of Buddha. It could be imitation of Amos. It could be imitation of, of Fannie Lou Hamer. It could be imitation of Mary Lou Williams on the piano. The love in that music. The Duke Ellingtons and Count Bessie. This is the 100th anniversary of Italian genius from working class Hoboken named Frank R Sinatra, right? Keep the focus on his music and the love in that music. Now, the life is something else. It's more complicated. <laughs> it's like Miles Davis, the music, not the life. <laughs> but that's true for all of us. It's the work and the witness is not every element of our lives because we fall short, you see. And how do we turn it around? By the best kind of examples possible, which are always fallen, finite, crack vessels that we are. And I think that, uh, Thank God that this center is trying to create. It's not simply for me just a common ground because we can have a common ground and still be wrong. It's a higher ground that allows us to accent our common humanity, accent the overlap. I don't ever want full unanimity and agreement with my dear brother. That's the last thing you want. 
because you want a variety of different voices. You want a jazz orchestra. The jazz orchestra is about what? Everybody lifting their voice. You don't want just echoes. It's their voice. That's what democracies are about, right? Everybody having the courage to, listen, to lift their voices and see where the overlap is, the, con the conflict and the contention. But it has to be mediated with a respect. It has to be mediated with a willingness to learn. And that's only by doing. That's only by example. You know, I, I suspect there are probably some folks from Kojic in this audience. So uh, we don't want to leave out Arizona drains from your wonderful, wonder. am I talking right? Am I ta telling the truth? Absolutely. We'll break that down a little more for everybody. Oh, the great gospel vocalist yes. of the early Pentecostal holiness church, the Azusa movement. Yeah, all we have are a few pretty crackly recordings, but one of the great gospel singers, uh, very much, of course, in, in the Church of God in Christ, you know, the largest black Pentecostal uh, 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 church in the United States, uh, very much a kind of a foundational figure in the wonderful music of the Kojic uh, tradition. Uh, well, um, back to the equality and, and, and mobility uh, thing. You know. you, you were, you were, I didn't want to interrupt. I mean, you were, you were soaring. You were soaring like an eagle. Uh, and, and, I, and I, take, I, I take your point. I mean, I, 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 I think you're, you're right when you say, well, I don't mean equality in the sense that we all have the same. And of course, we wouldn't want to trust the government with the power to redistribute wealth in that, in that way, because we know what the experience of human beings with that is. Gulags. Knocks on the door, taken away in the night. The record of that kind of socialism communism is not good and we don't want that. But we do want a fair and honest system. People should, people should be able to reap the benefits of their hard work, of their initiative, of their willingness to take risks, and that's going to produce inequality, economic inequality. But Professor West says that he himself doesn't believe he deserves uh, to be earning as much as Beyonce. He thinks that, you know, maybe they, they're both real pretty, but she has some other <laughs> talents that, that qualify her for higher, higher earning. But I think we should remember that we've had long periods of significant inequality, in some respects greater inequality than we have today, but we still had social mobility. Uh, what's Bill Gates have? I think in the latest uh, Forbes uh, uh, 500 list, uh, if I'm re remembering correctly, uh, this is a ballpark for He's got about $80 billion. And I think uh, the fellow from Mexico, uh, Slim, Carlos Slim, has uh, he's next. He's got maybe 77. And Warren Buffett, uh, he's, he's been reduced down to 68 or whatever billion dollars. If you account in today's money, John D. Rockefeller in the 19th century had $990 billion he could have hired Bill Gates to park his car. <laughs> Andrew Carnegie had something like 400 or 500 billion dollars in, in today's dollars. But even in those periods, we were able, through some of them in any event, to sustain social mobility. So I want, that's why I want the focus to be on enhancing opportunities for social mobility and not on equality as such, yes, the, 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 the fairness issues are there, and we, we, that's going to call for certain numbers of reforms, but not just in the economic system. What do people need to flourish? What do people need to be able to sustain themselves and to move up and to make life better for their children? There are some economic factors as such, some properly economic factors, and then there are also cultural factors. And we got to take that seriously. Now, it would be a mistake to think that the cultural factors are the only factors, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? You know, but the cultural factors are part of the mix. Neither the purely economic factors nor the cultural factors will tell the whole story. Daniel Patrick Moynihan, 50 years ago, last month, I think, March, issued his famous report on the Negro family, very concerned about cultural issues with the collapse of the family in the African-American community, worrying, warning that the consequences for black families, for black people, would be dire. Now, 
for his labors. Moynihan, who was a young professor at Harvard working for Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, liberal, Democrat, working in the Labor Department, Assistant Secretary of Labor. For his labors, he got called a racist. He was accused of blaming the victim. I learned from my friend Yuval Levin that actually that phrase was first used in connection with criticizing Moynihan. But of course, Moynihan turned out to be absolutely right about so many things. Now, one thing he wasn't right about, though, as it turns out, can't be faulted. He, he was looking at the data he was looking at. But one thing he wasn't right about was he thought it had just about everything to do with race and the history of oppression, which obviously is one of the great stains on the American conscience, the history of a plush Jim Crow, white supremacy. But now we know that he was wrong about that because work by Murray and by Putnam and by David and Amber Lapp now shows us that the very same cultural factors leading to the very same personal catastrophes and social pathologies exist in non-minority communities. In my native Appalachia, I grew up in West Virginia, if we go to Harlan County, Kentucky, or Boone County, West Virginia, or to the old Rust Belt cities and look at the situation of the white working class, we see exactly what Moynihan was noticing when it came to urban, largely urban uh, poverty. He was also concerned about rural poverty. We see basically the same thing. Now, this is going to require a response. Yes, you need jobs. Absolutely. We need to be finding ways to bring jobs to communities where there aren't jobs. They need employment. People can't work if they don't have opportunities for employment. It's one thing to say, get a job. But if there's not a job there to get, it doesn't work. But you also need people who are employable, who have cultivated, have had inculcated in them the skills, the virtues, to be able to work as employees and to build themselves up and to rise in their employment situations. So we need to work on all that. Neither, neither the extreme right nor the extreme left has the solution here. One side's going to say it's all cultural. The other side's going to say it's all economic. If we bring in jobs, problems be solved. The other side says, well, if we fix the cultural problems, everything be solved. But life never comes at you, almost never comes at you. It's very rare for life to come at you in that neat and tidy a way. Realities usually have complicated, complex sets of causes. That's certainly true for social phenomena, phenomena that are constituted at least in part by human deliberation, judgment, and choice. And that's certainly true uh, in, uh, in this case. So I, I think we need the very best thinking from people in a range of dis economists, sociologists, cultural critics, and not just academic people. One of the great things about Moynihan, Cornell and I were talking about this today, as a matter of fact, one of the things about Moynihan, he was rare in American politics. He was an intellectual political leader, an intellectual statesman. Now, we can, we can think of other such people in history. Benjamin Disraeli, William Gladstone, his great opponent in 19th century Britain, Winston Churchill. Some people might say uh, Woodrow Wilson here in the United States, who was, of course, a great mm -hmm. scholar at Princeton who became uh, president of the United States. Uh, Moynihan was that. And in addition to people who are working in universities and in think tanks, we also need people in public life who are intellectually engaged at producing thoughtful analyses of the underlying problems and thoughtful proposals. Now, even a thoughtful proposal might not work. The problems are so difficult, so hard, so deeply entrenched, and we can't be afraid to try something for fear that it won't work because we really don't have the option of doing nothing when so many people are suffering. So if we try, we fail. Okay, we try, we fail, we'll try something else. But that doesn't mean we should try the first offer that comes along. <laughs> you know, We need to think hard and we need to think together. We need to really get past the ideological divisions on this. People need to be talking to each other in a serious way, laying aside the preconceptions and looking at the economic and cultural factors that have to be addressed. If we're going to do justice by these precious creatures who are our fellow human beings, as Cornell said, made in the very image and likeness of the divine creator and ruler of the universe, 
possessing a profound, inherent, and equal dignity, or what Professor West calls sanctity. It's for their sake, it's for the sake of human persons, that we worry about these issues at all and want to make these reforms. And that's worth setting your mind to. Yes, I agree with so much, but let me zero in on what I disagree. Uh, uh, namely that when you say that Moynihan missed that one factor, uh, and it's a factor that means that it's not just race, but when white brothers and sisters are socially neglected and economically abandoned, their families get weak, their communities get feeble, they wrestle with unemployment and underemployment. Look at the wave of deindustrialization in the last 45 years in this area. Owing to what? global capital going to cheaper markets and leaving working people dangling. And you've got to revise and revamp. Now Grand, Grand Rapids bounced back the way Pittsburgh did, but Youngtown has a problem. Now to account for that is attending to structural and institutional processes, not just individual attitudes and prejudice. So when Moynihan said that, lo and behold, it looks like this is the, the Negro family weakening and so forth, and Charles Murray comes along later and says, the exact thing happens among poor whites. Because they're all human beings. They're wrestling with socially neglected and economically abandoned context. Their schools are decrepit. Too often they commit soul murder for the children, not allowing them to believe in themselves and have enough confidence in themselves to achieve. Then they've got the market culture coming at them, TV, video, radio, obsessed with orgiastic foreplay. That's what much of US television is. It's the cheapest form of bodily stimulation. Now that's not to say you don't have some, some high quality television. We got 500 channels, so we ought to have some. <laughs> it's not a complete wasteland. But they know the ones that actually gonna make money are gonna appeal to the baser pleasures rather than the higher joys. And then you got drug invasion, then you've got gun invasion, and you got something very different than what we had when I was grew up when I was growing up. I grew up in a ghetto, but it was a ghetto Donnie Hathaway and Leroy Hudson sang about. Love, fortitude, strength, willingness to tell the truth and still embrace. The hood is very different, you see. And there are white hoods, and brown hoods, and yellow hoods, and red hoods, and black hoods. So that structural institutional dimension turns out to be very important that Moynihan tended to downplay. And if we do accent the way in which it ought to be accented, it means, well, how is it that Capital can be so global in its flexibility, but labor is stuck. That working people have to deal with contracting opportunities, and yet the profits are being made more and more at the highest level. Look at the Trans-Pacific Partnership under the Obama administration. That's NAFTA on steroids. What impact will that have for working people? It's going to generate tremendous profits. Where will it go? Pockets on accountability for everyday people, you see. So in that sense, Moynihan had the courage to raise an issue that was very unpopular. There's no doubt about that. But by not attending to that structural institutional analysis to the degree that he ought, we end up seeing the same thing. I mean, you, you, our dear brother Robbie is from Appalachia itself. He, he is intimately acquainted with how human beings creatively respond to poverty. In this case, white brothers and sisters, right? But in very different historical moments. You know, your family was strong. Yeah. Unbelievable commitment to education. On to uh, the, Swarth the Swarthmore, that magnificent place. And, and then um, Oxford and the rest is history with Robert George. Uh, but every working class or even working uh, uh, person is not a Robert George. You got a lot of cousins, I'm sure, yeah, who <laughs> had a rough time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I certainly think that it's true that Moynihan did not get the complete 
picture, and it was very different economic time. On the other hand, in part, he was deflected from seeing other factors because so much seemed to him to be accountable, uh, to be accounted for by reference to race and the history of race relations and racial oppression. That can blind sometimes as much as it illuminates, and that's, Moynihan is a good case of that. Now, the, the kinds of concerns you have about, for example, NAFTA on, on steroids, those are the kinds of things that I said we need to address when I'm talking about properly economic issues. Where we sometimes make a mistake is to suppose that if we could solve those, everything would be rosy. But they wouldn't have been, they weren't in 1965, and they won't be in 2015 unless we address the cultural factors. Nicholas Kristof, Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times, a great liberal columnist, public intellectual, about six months ago wrote an article after he took a little visit to my home state of West Virginia, and his purpose was to examine how some of the great society programs and other anti-poverty programs had worked, how well they were doing. And he came back and he wrote a, wrote a column. Uh, if, if you were my student, you'd all have your laptops out now and you'd, you'd look it up and you'd tell me where I misquoted something. But uh, he wrote a column and roughly speaking, he said, as a liberal, this is hard for me to say, but some of our well-intentioned programs have had the perverse effect of entrenching poverty and here I'm sure he had to take a deep breath to get these words out of his mouth 50 years after Moynihan, created dependency. Hard to say, but he was telling the truth. He was willing to tell the truth. And as an Appalachian who had witnessed this, and this is not to say that you should be blaming the victim. It's not to say that only cultural factors matter, but it does take courage to say they matter along with the kinds of structural concerns that Professor West has in mind. Now, addressing either the cultural or the uh, properly economic ones or structural institutional ones is not going to be easy for two reasons. One, it's hard to figure out what the right thing to do is. I mean, do we really want protectionism in the contemporary economy? Probably not, or if we do it, it's going to have to be done extremely carefully so that it doesn't have perverse consequences. On the other hand, what Professor West has pointed to is true. Jobs running away to where labor costs are low, and sometimes conservatives need to admit this, labor costs are low because people are being exploited. Right? Both sides have to tell the truth. You know, I, I admire Christoph for telling the truth about dependency. And I and my fellow conservatives do need to tell the truth about exploitation, including in places like China, where neither party wants to admit it because everybody wants to do business. This is one of the things I admire about Professor West. Gets him in a load of trouble with the people who are supposed to be on his side. He doesn't get invited to the White House very often. <laughs> not under Bush, not under Obama, but he's willing to tell the truth about China. Saudi Arabia. When I um, uh, recently in my work as um, I was chairman at the time of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, uh, I led our commission's effort to try to do something about the outrageous mistreatment of some prisoners of conscience in Saudi Arabia, especially Raif Badawi. Uh, who was uh, sentenced uh, to a long term of prison and to a thousand horrible lashes for merely exercising his basic human right to criticize the government, to criticize the religious and political authorities. Our government didn't want to hear about it because we have business to do with Saudi Arabia. They've got oil. They're geostrategically important because they're the counterweight to Iran. But who was the first voice lifted up in support of my efforts? Professor West, because he was willing to tell the truth, even if it means you don't get invited to the White House <laughs> or onto MSNBC. Bill Maher still loves you. He's like me. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we need. What, and, 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 and as Professor West said, it's got to be taught, especially to our young people, by both precept and example. It's not just enough to preach it. You've got you to gotta set the example. And so when Professor West stands up and speaks out, about, for example, exploitation in China or the horrible 
situation in Saudi Arabia. Um, he makes me very proud to be his brother. Thank you. Let me, uh, mm -hmm. we can go ahead and applaud. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> I know there, there are a lot of people in the audience who would like to ask questions. We have two microphones, one here. For those who are leftists, you know, I guess you can go over the left mic, and those who are on the right, you have the right mic over there. And uh, if you would uh, make your statement in the form of a question, we're going to impose the Jeopardy rule. I would appreciate it very much. Okay, we already have uh, people lined up. So let's start with you, Noah. Yeah, my name is Noah Thalen. I'm in the Cook Leadership Academy here at the Howland Sands Center. <clears throat> I had a question. I'm in the uh, business school here, and you talked a lot about awakening people, um, particularly young people. I guess how do you, uh, you know, I, certainly not a characteriz characterization of everyone in the business school, but how do you, how do you awaken people that are, um, you know, to, to use biblical language, kind of in search of mammon, but not really in search of perhaps enlightenment or not really uh, willing to deal with things on a deeper level? Question, my dear brother. When I said that, there's a wonderful line in Kant's Critique of Pure Reason where it says, examples are the go card of judgment. Examples. They see you in the business school, and yet you refuse to fetishize just the making of money. Now, we have to distinguish between fetishizing money and having money. I'm not promoting people having no cash. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about the idolizing and fetishizing of money in such a way that it downplays the quest for integrity and honesty. So you end up with a whole generation who just can't wait to be sellouts, to sell their souls for a mess of polish and think that's the benchmark of, of success because you're highly visible or you're, or you're a public celebrity. Is it, what do you stand for? Well, I really haven't worked that out yet, but I got a lot of cash. <laughs> that's spiritual immaturity. That's moral constipation. You might have a memory of what's right, but it won't flow because you got so much greed and love of money getting in the way of the flow. You see, you want to be the kind of brother who you're in the business school, but not fully of the business school. You see what I mean? Yeah. Nothing wrong with being there, but if the dominant culture is just fetishizing money, you say, that, I don't want to be a spiritual blackout. I want to be a moral being, a human being, trying to become a force for good in the best way that I possibly can. And that's just true for all of us, in whatever context we find ourselves. Yeah, you want to take one? yeah thank Noah for that question. Um, we certainly don't want to demonize business people or businesses. Um, what we do without them, where would Professor West and I get a paycheck? <laughs> if it weren't for people who made money through initiative and hard work uh, in business, who contribute that money. America's a wonderful country for philanthropy. The world's never seen such a country when it comes to philanthropy. Much of that giving is to colleges and universities. Princeton's got, I think last I checked, an $18 billion endowment. Where do you think that came from? It wasn't that the professors were each pitching in <laughs> five bucks from our salaries. We're on the taking end, us professors, not on the giving uh, end. And business is a noble calling. It, it, it's even a vocation can be a vocation, no question about that. Also, don't want to demonize business schools. Nothing that I said and nothing that Professor West said is meant to, to, to say that there's something inferior, much less something immoral, about choosing a business education. But we think that those of you who have chosen a business education should, in the course of your four years as an undergraduate, also be exposed by your university. They've got a fiduciary responsibility to do it to at least some taste of, to quote Matthew Arnold, the best that has been thought and said, to some of the great reflections philosophically, the great works of literature, the great works of history. That's got to be part of the mix. And you should also be educated around fellow citizens, fellow citizens, fellow students, who are focused on liberal arts, so that when you're sitting down for coffee or a meal, you're engaging with them. You're learning from them. Now, they're also learning from you. Everybody has something to teach as well as something to learn. But that balance has to be there. And I want to agree 100% with Professor West. 
even if you're in business school, which is great, which is fine, even if you're in business, which is great, which is fine, the key thing to avoid is the fetishization of anything that is merely material or merely emotive. Now, we'd give a different speech to somebody who was aspiring to be an actor or a singer. But although it would be a different speech, it would be the same basic warning. Maybe you're not after money. Maybe you're after glory. Maybe you're after fame. Maybe you're after influence. Maybe you're after affirmation. Maybe you're after applause because you're addicted to it. It's like a drug. I can tell you that. Applause is like a drug. It addicts you. You get some, you want more. And you say things that people approve of. So you get more of that applause. So we're all facing the same challenge. The kids in liberal arts, they're facing the same challenge. Just a different particular goal. And many, many wonderful business people are not idolaters. They don't want money just to have money. They don't want money just to be important because they have money and get invited to things. Um, they want to have money so they can do some good with the money. Uh, so you, you needn't be ashamed in the least of what you're doing. And if you choose that career, I know that you know a particular, as, as a person have a different career in mind, but if you would choose that career or other who's who choose that career, as I say, that can be a vocation and any vocation is a mission to do good. Well, thank Professor you. Andrew Spear. Yeah, uh, uh, good evening and, and thank you very much. It's been very interesting listening to you, you know, all that you've had to say. Um, you've painted a particularly, I think, compelling and somewhat bleak picture of the way that marketization and you know, the incentive to search for uh, recognition, status, profit, uh, lead people to behave in ways that are probably contrary to their own best sort of moral interests, right? And, and your solution for that is a kind of, you know, uh, to appeal to a kind of uh, virtues, um, you know, integrity, honesty, courage that we need to develop these and hold these up uh, against that kind of dominant culture. Um, and so here's what I'm curious about. I guess I think of, you know, contemporary sort of market culture and society it goes along with, to a certain extent, at least historically, the liberal political tradition. I mean, think of John Locke and the social contract theorists. And so in a sense, I mean, you can see contemporary market society and commercialization and commodification as rather natural consequences of our political form of life. So uh, to, to, to an extent that, you know, the virtues get eclipsed. And so the question is, how do you cultivate and teach the virtues in a culture where even the, the political system, which I think we probably don't want to jettison, um, itself seems to eclipse them or you know, call them into question or hold out carrots much more appealing to the vast majority of people. So that's sort of a, just a, a question I have because you know, both parts are very interesting. Yeah, that's a very yeah. profound question though, brother. No doubt about that. And if we sounded bleak, that's exactly what we wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> we live in catastrophic times, ecological catastrophe looming, nuclear catastrophe still a possibility, the economic catastrophe of poverty and increasing wealth and equality, the spiritual catastrophe of losing sight of non-market values like love and fidelity and integrity, and certainly the, uh, the moral catastrophes of various forms of hatred. It could be against Arabs and Muslims. It could be against gays and lesbians. It could be against Jews. It can be against black people or red people or women, a vicious legacy of male supremacy and so forth. Again, it could be against Christians in certain contexts. A certain, certain right-wing Christians. Was, <laughs> there's so many more right-wing Christians than revolutionary Christians like myself that uh, <laughs> when it's anti-Christian, it's gonna be more directed toward my right-wing Christian brothers and sisters who need critique, but certainly must never be hated like anybody else. So what do we do? Well, first thing you have to have a commitment to is the truth and condition of truth is to allow the suffering to speak. So you have to have a public conversation that at least attempts to tell the truth about the situation. How do you shatter the sleepwalking? How do you call into question people living in denial? The Disneyland mentality. Oh, things are wonderful. Oh, just in your house, in your neighborhood. What about on the chocolate side of town? How are things over there? What is the relation between their use in the prison industrial complex? What is the relation between their use and the schools? What is the relation between their use and the police? Oh, we all in this together. We hang together, we hang separately. That is part of the truth telling that's required, but it's still bleak. 
I think it's always a flickering candle in the dark. That's Shakespearean and Chekhovian and, and Toni Morrison. That's really p the best of the human condition. And we went, when well, we had this conference, well, 50 years ago, this was, the school was only about five years old. <laughs> but if we had this dialogue here 50 years ago, it was bleak then, especially in certain contexts where people were catching hell, right? Even though people could have been in highly deodorized contexts where they thought everything was so nice and smooth and what kind of world are you living in? Your world's too narrow, too truncated. Get out of your bubble. The world is full of a lot of suffering and misery. How do we engage it with courage and integrity and sensitivity? So you're absolutely right. But I do believe the raw stuff of any change, and in the end it's going to be social movements, it's going to be organizing and mobilizing high quality leadership. But if it doesn't have love at the center and integrity and honesty, it's sounding brass and tinkling simple. It's empty. It's smoke and mirrors. You see, and it just reproduced the same old vicious cycle of domination and oppression and so forth. So that your question is a difficult one in one sense, and on the other hand, it's the same bleak condition has been ever since we dysfunctional species that we are have been wrestling with life merging out of the caves. What, uh, what I found particularly deep and challenging about uh, the professor's question is that he pointed to the uh, enlightenment liberal tradition's desire to tame politics by removing its moral content and valorizing the private life. To expand the private sphere uh, uh, where everyone could just lead their own lives, doing as they please, staying out of each other's way, uh, to, to, to expand the private sphere and to limit what goes on in the public sphere to a certain set of considerations and reasons. The professor mentioned Locke. Perhaps its, uh, its uh, fullest uh, expression in our time was the uh, philosophical project of John Rawls. Some, some, some young people here, uh, I know you've studied Rawls in your political theory, the late John Rawls towering figure. Uh, you must have studied with him when you were a graduate student at Harvard, yeah. 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 And Rawls's effort was to find a domain of what he called public reasons, which was the domain in which the contest would be held, but would be limited by excluding reasons that were not public, matters that were not properly of public concern, largely moral matters, more matters having to do with virtue, the good of life, the good things of life. He didn't want our battles to be over the good but merely over the structures in which we would each in our own way pursue the good. Now, I have been a severe critic of Rawlsian uh, philosophy, but I had great respect for Rawls, and I found the work to be a tremendous uh, challenge. Now, even as a critic, I recognize that the impulse was entirely understandable and legitimate. Where did this enlightened, what did this enlightened project its enlightenment project come out of, the horrible wars of religion, the brutal, bloody wars that tore Europe apart, where we're fighting over big issues, God, faith. The enlightenment project wanted to tame politics because untamed politics is dangerous. What did Hobbes say it was? Solitary, nasty, poor, brutish and short. That's life in the state of nature by Hobbes. So we got to do something uh, about that. Now it could be, and I, and I think this is the challenge of the professor's, he's, he's here somewhere, the professor's question. It could be that what we find as a result of the triumph of that enlightenment view of politics is the culture about which Professor West and I are complaining. So the, the sting in the tail of the professor's question, and I hear it, I feel it, is this. You two professors might very well think we produced a degraded culture, a selfish culture, a culture lacking in virtues. He went through them, humility, courage, steadfastness, faith, and so forth. But... Do you want to return to a situation 
where politics is no longer tame because politics goes back to fighting about the big issues, the nature of virtue. People disagree about what the virtues are. Do we want politics to be about that disagreement? People disagree about religious questions. We say, as Christians, every member of the human family, every human being is a precious child of God, made in the very image and likeness of God. Other people don't think that. They don't believe that. We really want our politics to be premised in some way on that? Do we really want to have battles about that? So he's saying to the two of us, look, it might be that you have a choice, a political system that at least provides safety by removing some of the most divisive and difficult and existential questions, or a degraded and debased culture which may be the natural outcome of a tamed politics. That's a serious challenge to us. That's a serious challenge to us because we don't want a degraded culture. We want public witness to be prophetic. We want the big issues of human life, meaning, value, virtue, to be engaged at the public level but we don't want to go back to the wars of religion. So we want to find an alternative, and the onus is on us. Rawls put his proposal out there, as had Locke before, and others. Fine, we have a big problem with it. We're critics of it. All right, fine. If you, West, if you, George, reject that, what's your alternative? What are you going to put in its place? What will politics look like as you would structure things? Serious question. Thank you very much. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> Cornell West and Robbie George are available to sign books. If you still have a question, you can ask them uh, at the book signing now, which will be out in the foyer. I want to thank you very much for a very stimulating conversation. Uh, this evening and exhibiting exactly what we're trying to get at at this Howenstein Center, the common ground principle that we're trying to achieve. And I think uh, Brother Cornell and Brother Robbie deserve a Howenstein Center tote bag. <laughs>